is time to talk about electric potential. Two positive charges, Q equals 10 to the minus, sorry, 5 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs, are both located a distance L equals 0.25 meters away from the origin and opposite directions along the x-axis. Well, I should look at what I'm drawing because then I might draw straight. So, we have two positive charges here. Both have charge plus Q. I'm tell I tell you, they are positive and they're a distance L from the origin in opposite directions along the x-axis, right? That's enough to figure out that this is at 0.25 meters, comma 0, comma 0, and this is at minus, two point, minus 0.25 meters, comma 0, comma 0. What is the electric field at the origin? What is the electric potential at the origin? By the way, a reading thing. Notice uh, when you read this, there are two questions here. See one question mark, another question, but I don't have A and B listed. So if you saw this on a test, I would expect you to answer both questions even though I didn't have them separated in A and B. So always be careful when reading to make sure you should read everything. Well, all right, so let's think about the electric field first because that one actually turns out to be pretty easy to answer. This is going to have an electric field this way. Um, so let's call this particle 1 and this particle 2. So that would be just E1. And I know E1 is going to equal KQ over L squared because L is the distance. K is Coulomb's constant, Q is that charge. Um, and then the direction, well, the capital R hat, as we've called it, which is the unit vector pointing away from this, is the minus x hat. So that's E1. And then E2, that's from that particle, E2, is equal to KQ over L squared, right? It's the same distance, it's the same Q. But now notice the direction is in the plus x hat direction. And we can use the principle of superposition so that the electric field at the, that position is the sum of the fields you would get from each point charge. And because we have minus and plus a thing, it's zero. So the electric field at the origin is zero. That's the first question. You are now very tempted to say, so the electric potential is zero also. Let's be more careful. We can also use the principle of superposition for the electric potential. And so remember for the electric potential from charge number one, well, if you are a distance L away from charge number one, it's KQ over L. That's the potential you get, a distance L away from a positive charge Q. Same thing for that one, you're a distance L away, and don't put in a negative sign, right? There's nothing about direction in electric potential. It only has distance. So the electric potential at the origin is not zero. Interesting, right? So. Um, the, the first thing is to don't be careful about jumping to conclusions. You can have a case where the electric field is zero, but the electric potential is not zero, right? So remembering what, what this really says is that delta V, the electric potential, is equal to E dot delta R as you move along a certain distance. So that it says is that right here, if I start here and I go an itty bitty distance away from the origin, the change in the potential from the origin would be zero but the potential itself wouldn't be zero. Now there's another thing I should say is by using this equation, I'm using the convention that the electric potential is zero infinitely far away from the point charge. Remember with electric potential you always get to choose where the zero is. Well, we're using the convention for these that it's infinitely far away. In that convention, this is the electric potential at the origin. Now I want to do another problem that I didn't assign because it's interesting, I think. So I'm going to get rid of those two little arrows and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the sign of this particle over here to be negative Q. So we have negative Q that way. So let's do the electric field again. So the electric field from that guy is that way. And the electric field from this guy is, well, now it's also that way, right? Because the electric field is going to point towards the negative charge. So E2, sorry, E1 is exactly the same because I haven't changed the particle, I haven't changed the distance. But E2 is now different because I have changed that particle. So E2 is equal to, um, well, we're going to have K times, uh, let's see, minus Q over L squared, and then the unit vector I put, you're tempted to just put in a negative x hat, because, oh, that's the direction, let's put in negative x hat. But by doing that, you would have already taken this negative sign into account. Remember, the equation is, the equation that we're using is kq over r squared r hat, where this is q, this is r vector, 
And that is our hat, right? Our hat points up from the charge to the observation point. So from the charge to the observation point, the unit vector is plus x hat in this case. So now if I have minus kq over l squared x hat plus minus kq over l squared x hat, I now get minus 2kq over l squared x hat. So the total electric field is to the left. Let's calculate the potential. In, uh, from V1, it's still the same, but from V2, we now have a minus Q, and now the potential is zero. So it is possible to have a non-zero electric field when the potential is zero. What this tells us again now, though, is that if I consider a little displacement away from the origin, the potential will change. It won't stay at zero, because the delta V, not the V itself, but the delta V is what really is determined by and determines the electric field. So that is the first problem. The second problem, we're considering the same two charges. Um, they're starting here. By the way, you may object that in the previous problem I gave you numbers, but I never calculated them. So go ahead and plug in the numbers, right? You can plug in the numbers I gave you. I'll calculate the numbers this time. Really, the more interesting part is working out the algebra and getting it all to work, and then you can plug the numbers in, but the, the cranking of the arithmetic is not the new thing that we're learning in this class. All right, so, so the two electric charges from the previous problem are released so that they move freely, and there are no other forces acting on either particle besides their mutual electric repulsion. When they are very far away from each other, how fast is each one moving? And then we're going to assume each one has a mass of 125 grams, and remember that is a way to write 125 grams. Okay, so now what you might be tempted to do, let's go ahead and do this, is think, well, let's figure out how fast this one is moving first. So I'm going to get the force of this guy. So first of all, I know there's an electric field. We'll call this particle one this time, just for, I don't know why, because I'm gonna. Um, this distance is now 2L, right, because it's L from here to the origin. So E1, and now E1 is not, at, last time we were figuring out the electric field at the origin. Now I want to get the electric field of just this guy at the position of this guy. This K, Q over 2L quantity squared in the x hat direction. So now I know that the force on particle 2 due to that is going to be K, Q squared, because that F is QE, over 2L squared x hat. And so now you think, well, I can use um, F equals MA figure out the acceleration, and then I might use V is equal to V0, which is 0 plus AT. I'll just do the X direction, because that's where everything is moving, um, and plug in this, A. Um, oh, but what's T? So, well, it has to be really, well, okay, there's a serious problem with what I'm doing. And that is, this acceleration is not constant. The acceleration is not constant because as the particles get farther from each other, the strength of the electric field of, of one particle at the position of the other particle goes down. So as the particles get farther and farther from each other, the electric field is getting weaker and weaker and weaker, which means that the force is going down, which means the acceler because the mass is constant, the acceleration is not constant, which means I can't use these constant acceleration kinematic equations. So the kinematic equations here aren't going to help me. So I need to do something else. Well, I don't actually care about how long it takes. Maybe I do, but I didn't ask for that, so let's say I don't care. So instead of thinking about electric fields, let's just think about conservation of energy. Right? So conservation of energy says EI plus the work done on the particles by forces we aren't tracking with potential energy is equal to EF. So the initial EI, well, there's no gravity in this problem. I've told you that. There are no other forces. Since there are no other forces, there's going to be no work done on these particles because we can track electric energy, or so the electric force, with electric potential energy. So when we have the electric potential energy initial plus Ke initial has to equal electric potential energy final plus Ke final. Okay. Now, they start at rest, so there's no initial kinetic energy. At the end, they're really, really, really far apart. And when they're really, really, really far apart, that's the convention we have chosen for no electric potential, so therefore no electric potential energy. So at the beginning, the total electric potential um, between these two particles 
is just going to be, um, well, what you do is, so, so the electric potential of, of, the, of the interaction of the two particles, this, there's a slight subtlety here, is I can figure out the electric field from one of these, sorry, the electric potential from one of these, so the electric potential of particle one at the position of particle two is just kq over 2l, which is the distance. And remember that PE is QV. So PE EI is equal to um, uh, duh, KQ squared over 2L. Now, you might say, okay, so now that I've done this one, let's get the potential energy of the other one, and that wouldn't be right. Because remember that this is the potential energy is always an interaction of things. So this is the interaction of the potential energy of this particle and this field. Where does this field come from? This particle. So by doing the interaction between this particle and this field, you've already included that particle. So this is the total initial potential energy. So now we know that if we take this up here, that kq squared over 2l is going to equal, when they are very far away, they will be moving at 1 half m vf squared, but there's going to be two particles. Now, how do I know they're moving at the same speed? I'm going to just appeal to your intuition here. You will notice that this thing is perfectly symmetric in that the force on this right now is the same as the force on that. And so, okay, so they're going to accelerate the same way. And now they'll be, so in a certain amount of time, they'll get the same distance apart. Now the forces are lower, but they're still the same as each other. So it's going to stay the same the whole time. So that means because of the symmetry, it's going to be the same speed at the end. So we know because they'll have the same speed at the end, we can do this. So we have kq squared over 2l is equal to mvf squared, or vf is equal to q times the square root of km over 2l. And that's pretty exciting. So now we can put the numbers in. Let's see if I can do it right this time. Um, remember, get my k right. So q is just 5 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. There's only one sig fig in this number. I'm going to pretend there's two. In fact, you know what I'm going to do is rewrite this so it says 5.0. K is 8 point... Oh, man. This is where I do it wrong. 9... Uh, you know what? I'm looking it up. 8.988 times 10 to the 9. Did I remember that right? Yes. Times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. You know, I'm going, to, I'm going to expand out the Newton here. So a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, so that becomes kilogram meters cubed, because there's the meter squared from the K and also one from the Newton, per coulomb squared second squared, times M, which is 0.12, can you tell I ran out of board space here? 0.125 kilograms, divided by 2 times L, and L was 0.25 meters, did I say that right? Yes. 0.25 meters, and this had a coulombs on it. Uh, and now I have a problem because my units aren't working. I made a algebra mistake. Um, notice this m here, I would have had to divide both sides by m. So this was wrong. It was q ah, times the square root of k divided by 2lm. Right, divide both sides by m, then I have vf is kq squared over 2lm, square root both sides, build that out, okay. Sorry for the algebra mistake. Um, anyway, I know everybody does it. Notice, you know how I caught that mistake, is the units weren't going to work out right. I thought, I must have done something wrong because the units aren't working out right. I look back, oh, that was my algebra mistake. This is one of the reasons why you want to put units in things. So, 5.0 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs is q, times the square root, K is 8.988 times 10 to the 9th kilogram meters cubed per coulomb squared second squared divided by 2 times 0.25 meters times 0.125 kilograms. All right. So inside the square root, this meters will cancel one of these, and that will become meters squared. Um, kilograms cancel kilograms. So I will have meter squared over second squared over coulomb squared, but that's under the square root. So the meter, so all of those get square rooted. It'll be meters per second per coulomb. The coulomb squared under the square root will cancel that. I'll get meters per second. It's what I want. So now I just have to put the numbers in. And to two sig figs, I get 
1,900 meters per second, which sounds fast, but okay, I mean, these, these are uh, particles with 10 to the minus three coulombs, which is an appreciable charge, it turns out, as these things go. And they're only, um, you know, 100 grams. Um, so these little light things with this electric force phew, go shooting off. So that sounds fast compared to like your walking speed or your car. One thing to think about is that all these equations that we're using, a lot of them break down if speeds get too close to the speed of light. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So I'm nowhere near the speed of light, so I don't have to worry about that. So that's the speed I get at the end. That's probably fine, and, and that's problem two. In the third problem, we have two half meter by half meter square plates separated by a distance of 2.5 meters. So trying, or sorry, 2.5 millimeters. That makes a pretty big difference. So trying to draw this in 3D is always a challenge. But there you go. So the idea is there's huge perspective here. That's 0.5 meters, and this is 0.5 meters. Whereas this distance is what do I say? 2.5 millimeters, 0 0.0025 meters. So immediately you can see as long as we're not close to the edge. The approximation that the plates is way bigger than the distance away from the plates is an excellent one. All right, the electric potential difference between the two plates is delta V equals 12 volts. So I'll do that in a different color because I like colors. Um, delta V is equal to 12 volts. Both plates have the same magnitude of charge spread evenly on them, but one plate has positive charge. Well, the other plate has negative charge. So let's just decide that this has positive and the bottom plate has negative. How much charge is on each plate? And you're all, well, dude, how do I even figure that out? Well, here's how. What do we know? We know electric potential. So what I'm going to do is draw this again, but in 2D so it's easier to draw what's going on. And we know that there is an electric potential difference of 12 volts between the two plates. Now, knowing that, delta V is equal to minus E dot delta R. If delta R and E are in the same direction, then V will go down, right? Because E dot delta R will be positive, so then delta V is negative, so V goes down. We know here, because electric field points away from positive and towards negative, that the electric field is going to be in this direction, right? So that means if I go from here to here, um, if I go from here to here, delta V will be negative. So if I call this the negative plate, or here, what I can do is, so that says this is at a lower potential than this. So V plus minus V minus, which is what I'm going to call delta V is 12 volts, right? This is at a lower potential than this. So this is a higher potential. So that's how it works. That's how you get that. Good. So now that I know that, what can I do with it? Well, actually, I can use this because I know this distance and I actually know that electric field. How do I know that electric field? Well, you may remember I told you in class one of the special cases I gave you for electric field, I gave you point charge. The one I gave you is that if you have a charge a plate with um, total charge Q on area A, a distance D above that plate, where D is very small compared to, to the distance to the edge of the plate, so I, I haven't really drawn it that way, but pretend I did, then the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field is K is 2 pi KQ over A, where A is the area of the plate, Q is the total charge on the plate, 2 pi is 2 pi, K is Coulomb's constant, and the, the direction of the electric field is that way for positive charge, down for negative charge. So, okay. So what that means is we know this electric field. There's going to be a 2 pi kq over a for this, another 2 pi kq over a for this. Both of them point that way. right? I'm using the principle of superposition. I did this in a video, I think the last video. So I know that the total magnitude of the electric field between these is going to be 4 pi, because there's, there's two of them, times k times q over a. Okay. I also know that e delta R, and I just have multiplied magnitudes here because I know E dot delta R is, um, well, they're parallel to each other, so it's going to be a positive thing. So E delta R 
is equal to delta V in absolute value. So that delta V is going to equal 4 pi K Q over A delta R. Now you say, wait, shouldn't it be negative delta V? Well, yes, but I'm going to take the absolute value of delta V. So really this E delta R is delta V. If I'm going, if my delta R, to make my delta R positive, if my delta R is that, then delta V is V minus minus V plus, which is the negative of this, right? So if I call delta V the positive of this, really I should have had the negative there. So it all works out. And so now we, now we have everything we need to know because we know A, we know delta R, we know delta V, we know K. So we can solve this for Q. Let's see if I can do this without algebra errors. Q is equal to A delta V over 4 pi K delta R. And so now all I have to do is plug in numbers, which I will do, oops, I'm run out of space. I will do that up here. So Q is equal to A is 0.5 meters squared, right, because it's 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters. Delta V is 12 volts. Now this is where, this is where I always think, what, what's a volt in terms of other stuff? Let's see if I can do this right. So remembering, and how, how do you remember what a volt is? You can just look it up. But here's what I'm going to do is remember that volts per meter is the units of electric field. That's also equal to newtons per coulomb. So a volt is equal to a newton meter per coulomb, which is the same as a joule per coulomb. So that's a kilogram meter squared per coulomb second squared. That's what a volt is. So I'm just going to write it like that, kilogram meter squared per coulomb second squared. I could have written it volts, but this way I can make sure my units all cancel, right? times 4 times pi times 8.988 times 10 to the 9th. Remember, this is Newton meter squared per coulomb squared, so I'm going to write that kilogram meters cubed per coulomb squared second squared times delta R. And delta R, I'm already seeing I'm going to have trouble here with my unit, so I'll think about that when the time comes. Delta R is 0 0.0025 meters, and here's why I'm worried about units, because I have meters cubed times meters is meters to the fourth. I only have meters squared on the top. So something went wrong somewhere. Oh no, here's another meter squared. Ha ha! Meter squared times meter squared and meters to the fourth. So the meters all cancel. The kilograms cancel. I have second squared divided by second squared. The seconds all cancel. I have coulombs over coulombs squared, or sorry, what I have is 1 over coulombs divided by 1 over coulombs squared, which is the same as coulombs squared over coulombs is coulombs. So I'm going to get something in coulombs. So all that's left is to put it in my calculator. And what I get is 1.062 times 10 to the minus 8th coulombs. That doesn't sound like a lot of coulombs. But what you're going to discover is that when we start playing with actual capacitors, this is going to be more like the kinds of charges that we're actually dealing with. 1.062 times 10 to the minus 8 coulombs, but we really only have two sig figs here, so I'm going to call it 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8 coulombs. That is the charge on each plate. You don't divide it by 2, right? Because this Q here came from the Q on this plate. Oop. Then you also had the Q on this plate, but it was the same Q, so the fact that we had the two of the Qs was taken into the fact that we had the 4 there instead of the 2. So this Q is the amount of charge on the positive plate, negative that is the amount of charge on the negative plate. That is problem three. A charge capital Q is fixed at the origin. So I'm going to just write the numbers up here. So Q is equal to 0 0.025 coulombs. And we have another charge, little q. Little q is equal to minus 4.0 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. All right. So those are my two charges. Capital Q is fixed at the origin. My blue pen is dying on me. I'm going to weep. Um, capital Q is fixed at the origin. I have a little charge that I want to move from a position of, um, you know what I'm going to do is not make this x and y. I'm going to make this x and z because nothing moves in Y. So for this to work, then Y is into the board, but we're not even going to draw it because nothing's happening. It starts at the position 0 0.1, 0, 0 meters. All right, so we'll call that X0, where X0 equals 0 0.1 meters. All right, the initial position I tell you is 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0 meters. And I need to move it to position here, what well, I'll call that Z1. 
So Z1 is equal to 0 0.50 meters, or RF, the final position, is equal to 0, 0, 0, 0.5 meters. How much work must you do? So you're going to move it. I mean, actually, it doesn't matter which path you move it along, but let's say you're going to move it along that path. This is a negative particle, right? So you know that the force is going to be, so the electric field of this guy, because this is a, because capital Q is positive, the electric field points away. So the force on the negative particle is going to be opposite the, um, it's going to be opposite the uh, direction of the electric field. So everywhere along here, the force is going to look like this, and it's going to get weaker as time goes. So eventually the force is there. So those are all the little s, but notice the force changes based on where you are. So if I want to try work is equal to f dot delta r, that's not going to help me because the f is changing the whole way along, and this is going to be very difficult to do. So let's just not even think about forces. Let's think instead about energy. So energy initial plus work done on the particle is equal to energy final. Let's say it starts and ends at rest. Do I say that? Well, I don't say that, but let's assume that's what I mean. So the electric potential energy initial plus the work done on the particle, so that's how much work you must do, has to equal the electric final potential energy. And I didn't add in kinetic energy because it's not moving either at the beginning or the end. So that says the work I have to do then is just the change in the electric potential energy. And that is not as bad because that's just Q times the final potential minus Q times the initial potential. And we know the potential around capital Q is just KQ over, let's say, R, where R is the distance. So that tells me, so I know now the final potential. Oh, by the way, by the way, this Q is going to be a negative number. I don't put a negative here because the Q is negative, but we'll just remember that that's going to happen. So Q, so the final potential is K times capital Q over the final distance is Z1. And the initial potential is Q times K times capital Q over X0. Very good. Um, at this point, I could plug in numbers. I'm going to do one more line. Oh, I'm not going to erase the kitties. So I'm going to draw it above. I'm going to do one more line of algebraic simplification because I could factor a K Q Q out of this times 1 over z1 minus 1 over x0. Right. So just this is the physics is done. I'm doing algebra now. So now I just have to plug in the numbers. So I'll do that up here. Right. I'm working backwards on the blackboard now. And it's not even a blackboard, it's a whiteboard. So k is 8.988 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Capital Q is 0 0.025 coulombs. Lowercase q is minus 4.0 times 10 to the 4 coulombs. And then finally, I multiply in 1 over z1 is 0 0.50 meters minus 1 over 0 0.1 meters. Right, so there's that negative sign there. So now this is something I could put in my calculator. Let's Before we do that, let's think about units. I have coulombs squared in the denominator. I have coulombs and coulombs in the numerator. They cancel. I have meters squared in the numerator. These two things, when put together, right, I'm adding something that's 1 over meters to something else that's 1 over meters. So when I put them together, it will be 1 over meters. So that will cancel one of these. So I'm left with Newton times meters, which is joules, which is what I wanted. So the units will work. So let's put the numbers in the calculator. All right, into two sig pigs, I get 7.2 times 10 to the 5 joules. That's a decent number of joules. By the way, this should have been 10 to the negative 4 up here. Just copied it wrong. So that is the answer. So um, the lesson from this. Yes, we know that work is, is F dot delta R. But that's not always going to be easy. So think about, is F, before you just calculate an F and plug in, right? You might have been tempted. Oh, that's delta R. That's F. Plug in. You'd be all wrong. Think about F dot delta R. Is F constant all the way along delta R? No, it's really not. And in class, we talked about how you could play sleazy tricks by going around in a circle. But there's no because this is not the same distance as that. You know, if I was going, say, from here to there, I could go in a circle and say, oh, look, it's perpendicular and things work out. You know, there's nothing nice like that you can do here.
So when the f is varying and then f dot delta r isn't going to work, or you'd have to do calculus and line integrals. But remember, work is related to energy, and energy is just of position. So when the position changes, the potential energy changes, you don't have to worry about when and exactly where the work was done, but you can figure out exactly how much the energy changes. If the energy goes up, that's how much work you must put into the system. If the energy goes down, that's how much work you took out, which is the same as doing negative work on the system. All right, that is it for this set of problems. Thank <music> you.